All right, Dan, I'm calling this fireside here the definition of truth. Uh, what say you? Well, <laughs> it's a big subject matter, but we're going to try to keep it a little bit condensed uh, just for the purpose of what we do when we're trying to teach. Uh, we don't want to make things too complicated, so we don't want an eight-course meal, um, which will burden down the, the listener. So we're going to try to keep these uh, these sessions actually hopefully within, you know, at the most several minutes, but not not into an hour uh, or more or anything like that. Those are too intense, I think. Um, we kind of uh, have those uh, teaching sessions, uh, you know, put aside to the Zooms, the four week Zoom sessions for that reason. So if people are going on to this video right now and you haven't attended the Zooms, uh, certainly I recommend you do so they're free of charge. Uh, it's certainly up to you if you, you know, whether you want to gift or support it. Um, and, uh, at this point, we're just here to make sure that we do a thorough, um, you know, uh, you know, week by week, uh, educational, uh, that by the fourth week, you're actually at least have a basis or a foundation of truth, not a foundation of fiction which is what the world you're surrounded with is basing its existence on. So anyways, uh, truth is an interesting word. I'm going to take you into Noah Webster's 1828, and it says uh, truth. Uh, it says it is from trust, faith, fidelity. Um, and interesting, it says to marry. <laughs> okay which it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting, um, you know, definition for that reason. So when we're looking at, uh, um, it's also conformity to fact or reality. And when we go a little bit further down, we get honesty, we get correct. Uh, we also get real fact or just principle, real state of things. Uh, and then also says, uh, you know, basically, it relates to a few scriptures um, that uh, Jesus Christ is called the truth. So you can understand or comprehend that your Christian name would represent truth. It also has to do with good faith. Um, we also uh, have in the fourth definition in the 1828, veracity, purity from falsehood. Okay. So it's interesting, it says purity from falsehood. In the world of legal, we put on a false hood or wear a mask. Um, and therefore, that covers up the truth so that you do not see the truth. And therefore, you're in legal bondage. You're not free or have been liberated from what we call legal or sin or debt. Uh, everything about the legal system uh, basically is about wearing the falsehood that is opposite to the truth. So when we look at, uh, uh, you know, it's, it has faith in there. Now, if I have good faith, then I have God faith, truthful faith. And that means I'd be wearing that in my name. And therefore, your Christian name because Jesus Christ is truth, and the truth will make you free upon acceptance of him and wearing that highest level of kingdom sovereignty, uh, you are under the highest authority, and therefore you would not be operating in a legal sense, um, because that would have been literally eliminated by you coming to truth. You would not be walking in Roman legal fiction. When we go to Black's Law Fourth on Truth, uh, it states the following. There are three conceptions as to what constitutes truth. It says an agreement of thought and reality. Two, eventual verification. And three, consistency of thought with itself. So some would have to walk in that. Then when we go uh, just to the bottom of that definition, it takes us over to fact. And so we're going to go over to fact in Black's Law Fourth, because I think we want to deal with the facts. We don't want to be confused into believing a fact is a fiction. But when you act in fiction, the legal system deems it to be factitious. It's just their version of a fictitious word becoming 
what seems to take on some kind of concept of fact, and therefore they they uh, use a term called factitious at that moment. So we're going to go to fact. And when we get to fact, it's very clear in Black's Law Fourth, um, surprisingly written by these lawyers, but uh, uh, they, they do lay out the groundwork that they're only allowed to play within. And it says under the law of evidence, because everything has to be about evidence in a court of law. So we look at it, it says, law of evidence, a circumstance, event, or occurrence as it actually takes place, takes or took place, a physical object or appearance as it actually exists or existed, an actual and absolute reality. Now, there are no absolutes in legal. Just remember that legal rights are conditional. Only what comes from God, which is truthful and natural, your natural God-given Christian name, uh, is reality. And it says, as distinguished from mere supposition or opinion, a truth as distinguished from fiction or error. So here's a good example of explaining truth. When you look at the statement of birth record, which is not acceptable for legal identification because it carries truth in it. And where truth is, fiction of law does not exist. So on this particular format, and they did this on the majority, but they may look a little different between the 40s, the 50s, the 1960s, the 70s, but they underlined basically the error on the statement, even though they're marking it down as their legal subject matter. Christ is the subject matter of truth, your God-given, uh, your given name, which is a fact, not a fiction, um, is the subject matter of truth. In fiction, the legal state assigned surname or what is implied or implied to be assigned upon you or hoping that you will take it on, it's just offered. It's not something uh, that is actually really given. It's, it's not really gifted to you. Um, it's just uh, in a format of being assigned and hopeful that you will act upon it at age of election, legal election, and literally push play in the subject matter of debt. So this is just a framing. You can notice it's just a frame. They're just framing. It's just an accusation. They put an accusation over the child's head as if a child could ever respond to this. And then they just wait to see if you act on the accusation. In most cases, they have actually been uh, very successful with their leader. We're talking about the legalists, the lawyers, the bar associations, the devil's advocates who actually support uh, basically a right to do wrong so that they can collect and run a business off of this. So, uh, yes, um, the, the truth will set you free, but legal fiction will keep you in bondage. All right, Dan. Um, I'm just thinking here that uh, this is a good tie-in to the uh, next uh, segment here because we're really talking about uh, being non-legal as opposed to illegal. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. And so uh, we can probably just tie this in now if you want to. Sure, or, go ahead. Keep going. Um, and we'll just make a little bit of a add-on to the title um, of the of the uh, of the fireside. But anyways, there is a book called Slave. And, you know, I always want to, you know, give credit where credit is due. Uh, and it's not to praise for the idea of ego. It's just to say there was a lot of research done to put together that book. And it is a free PDF. Now, there are a few things that are in error in the book only uh, because of the fact is that we've learned bad um, terminologies at times, even though the subject matter of this book is based on that the word slave um, was removed out of the New Testament or what we'll call the Greek uh, scriptures, um, the New Covenant scriptures, and it was removed and they supplanted in the word servant because servant was more of a palatable word to use than the word slave. Now, if slave had been placed in, then there would have been the wording in some cases, a slave of Christ. 
But you see slave and the word servant uh, when you're looking at the original Greek word that showed up that, that they were that the early translators of the King James were using um, from the manuscript would have not been the way it came out in the translation. So they translated it servant, but it was slave, just as the word church was not the proper word to be in the King James. Uh, it was an ecclesia or a congregating or assembly, but it did not mean a physical building, so to speak. And therefore, they had placed this word church or kirk in there, which is a pagan temple or a pagan goddess. So we have to understand that legal goes into that heathen paganism, and it's so easy to fall prey to that. Um, because uh, when you look at the, uh, the book itself, uh, and we're just going to clarify that the word slave that is researched in here uh, from, came from the word doulos, and the Greek word doulos only means slave. So there are six other Greek words that are used for various types of usages of the word servant. But the word doulos can only be translated to mean slave. So slave would have been the appropriate word. Now, a slave is owned. It does not have any legal rights. So you being purchased, according to the biblical account, as the property of Jesus Christ, he purchased both the righteous and the unrighteous, you are Jesus Christ's property. You are the property of the Son of God. And therefore, uh, you would have no legal rights. Christianity, though it was mentioned in here, um, I don't think it was a deliberate error. It just happened. Um, but he mentioned that Christianity in the early first century was illegal. But that's not accurate. Christianity is non-legal. Legal actually even has a different meaning than law. Legal is got an etymology to mean to collect. Um, it is opposite to free grace. It is actually defined in Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of 1755 as the old dispensation or the old covenant. This would be before the remedy of Jesus Christ had come onto the scene with the new covenant, which fulfilled what the old covenant could not do. And it brought complete relief from sin and brought us back to the beginning, back to the rest day of God before Adam had brought sin and death and debt onto the world. So legal represents to an extent a jurisdiction of those who are in opposition to the will of God, those who want to deny free grace and think that they can perfect themselves through this concept of humanism. But legal, um, uh, no, Christianity is not. It is non-legal. It is not illegal. For Christianity to be illegal, it would have to have been in the legal category of jurisdictional control to be that. But Christianity is nothing to do with the legal system. Although most Christian believers have fallen prey to join not only a population of people bearing legal, debtor, Gentile surnames, identifying them and labeling them as of an uncovenanted nation, one who knows not the true God, out of the word Gentile at Samuel Johnson's Dictionary 1755, I'm certain that Samuel Johnson knew when he was operating under the legal surname Johnson, he was belonging to England and therefore he was not of a coveted nation with God. Um, so we just don't want to be confused on that term. Uh, there's a difference between illegal and non-legal, but Christianity is not legal. Okay. Uh, it is non-legal. It has nothing to do with legal because it canceled out all legal indebtedness, according to Colossians 2, 13 to 15. All right, Dan, thanks for clarifying that.